Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome. This is Seek Sustainable Japan, and our sub series we try to do once a month called Short Takes with Joy and Tova. So I'm JJ Walsh, Joy in Hiroshima, Japan, joined by. Hi, I'm Tova Kinoka here in Yokohama, just outside Tokyo. And it is getting warmer. Is it getting warmer there, Tova? Yes. Actually, today it's dropped back down a bit, but uh, I think the last couple of days it's been up 27, 28 degrees. So, really warm for, for this time of year. Yeah, which brings me to my first topic. Uh, especially in travel, I've been so encouraged by a lot of the people I've been guiding in Hiroshima. They're saying that the agents who book their tours are giving them reusable bottles, but many of them have to give up when they come. They say they can't find places to refill. <laughs> so I thought this would be a perfect time to mention the good work of my Nizu and the whole issue of why we should drink tap water instead of bottled plastic water. I am so tired of like stations and tourist information centers telling me and my guests to go fill up in the toilet sink. No, that is not acceptable. <laughs> or go buy a plastic bottle. No, not acceptable. We know there's more microplastics in plastic water bottles. It's not as healthy. It creates waste. Plus, we're having the issue of no garbage cans anywhere. So then you're creating more stress for the visitor and more hassle to deal with garbage. So there's so many win-win-wins about this. Now, you you had a great uh, example in Singapore, right? Yes. So I was in Singapore a few weeks ago for, for business, walked into the Hilton where I was staying, and this sticker was prominently displayed on the mirror in the bathroom there. So there were bottles, glass bottles of water available in the room as well. But this, you know, it, it's perfectly safe, drinkable tap water as, you know, everywhere here in Japan. So um, where it is safe to drink, um, I, I think there's, like you say, there's no excuse, absolutely no excuse for, for going with bottled water. So you just need your Maimizu and uh, <laughs> yeah, and there's it's, good water it's available. Fantastic and it's so simple, right? So yeah. what I've tried to do recently, which all of us can do, is when you see a place that has joined my Mizu, like these two places on my Instagram, just share and yeah. encourage them and say thank you for doing that. So my Mizu, do you want to explain what my Mizu is very simply, Toba? Okay, so my Mizu is a social enterprise that started a few years back on a mission to reduce plastic waste, starting with plastic bottles. Um, and so they've got an app that means you can search and find uh, your nearest refill station nearby. And that might be a, a sort of a, a tap in a, a park area, or it could be a shop like the ones that you've got there that have sort of signed up to the scheme as well and are happy to refill your water bottle for free. So. And my Mizu also does great social media. Yeah. For example, uh, what's up with plastic recycling in Japan? Is it really recycling? Uh, they lay it all out here. Material recycling means the plastic is actually reused into other products. Chemical recycling, thermal recycling is the most. So most of the plastic bottles that you put into the recycling container, you think it's being recycled, but it's not what you think. Most of it is being burned. And then it creates toxic ash from the burning process, which can't be used. It creates pollution. Plus, you have the sourcing of the plastic material, which creates lots of damage mm -hmm. as well and ends up in our oceans. Yes. So one of the articles that you shared this morning uh, shows that Japan is number two the most uh sending the most plastic waste to asian countries with less mm. advanced infrastructure than we have for dealing with plastic waste the netherlands yeah. is first japan is second this is shocking it really is shocking and again you know so much of it is unnecessary i can understand that you know in certain industries um and for certain items plastic is at the moment still the best um, option for packaging or whatever but for so many other things it's not it's not necessary there's a lot of um, plastic use that really doesn't need to be um, and so I think you know it, it's great to see articles like this in mainstream media highlighting really you know what's going on what is the data behind that um, it's not just sort of 
looking at you know the moral argument it's looking at the physical issues that this creates um how it's impacting the communities where this is sent to um and you know i i think it, it's important that we know this and that we're not naive about you know when we put our bottles in the um you know recycling thing just thinking that, that that's our job done actually we need to be a lot more conscious of where this is going as organizations as individuals um and really sort of think a lot harder about the impact of our actions as we're, we're buying plastic or using plastic whether that's in designing a product or whether it's um you know sort of as a consumer what we're buying and and how we are accepting it um when it's bought you know whether we're sort of accepting extra layers of plastic packaging that really aren't necessary. Yeah, and this really uh, started booming for less developed countries uh, when China refused to take plastic yes. waste from yeah. more advanced, more developed countries. Yeah. And that started this habit or strategy of sending plastic waste that we find too difficult in advanced mm -hmm. nations to recycle to less developed nations and it's just it doesn't make sense it's illogical it's hmm. unethical Very and creating so. more trouble in places where they can deal with it less it just yeah. we need more common sense in policy making especially yeah. when it comes to trash we need to deal with our own every country right exactly exactly because i mean there's also the you know the the um, the footprint, if you like, the carbon footprint of transporting all of this. It's crazy. You know, why Why are we um, sort of producing more <laughs> carbon emissions to ship it somewhere else where it'll sit and then, you know, create more problems, like you say, whether that's sort of toxic um, sort of uh, releases into to water streams, et cetera, or microplastics and whatever. But, you know, we're transporting this as well. This is, it's crazy. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, it really doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the Hilton. Uh, whenever I go to the Hilton in Hiroshima as well, I always uh, do a social media post about using my Mizu and filling up my water yeah. bottle. You know, and this is something that the public can do as well to to show that we care about this. Yeah. And whenever I go to any train station in Japan, I always make sure to ask the staff, ask the in information desk, where can I refill my bottle and create that question, which creates discussion behind yeah. the scenes. And hopefully in the planning of yeah. making refill stations. And I know the idea is, oh, we have machines. We just let people buy it. No, it's mm. not good enough. This, no. is, this is kind of a human rights issue. And we have good drinking water in Japan. Yeah. Right. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Well, sort of that relates to another point today, I think, with um, with hotels, particularly. Right. And sort of travel industry thinking. So Hilton's, I think, a great example of a company that's really doing what it says it's doing um, or trying to do. Um, obviously, still got, you know, work to do. But the likes of, you know, that that sticker on the, the mirror in the hotel in Singapore was a great move. And I know here in Japan, the, the hotels, the Hilton hotels, you won't find plastic bottles of water, which is great. Um, but I want to highlight the flip side of this as well, um, something I've experienced a few times recently, and I think you have too, um, where you go to the hotel and you find the, the little card, say, in the bathroom or on the bed saying, uh, if you put this card here, we, we won't change your linen every day. Or um, if you hang your towels on the rack rather than leaving them on the floor, Law, it um, help us save water because we care about the environment and we won't change your towels. So last week I was staying at a, a very prestigious um, hotel in Tokyo. I'm not going to name and shame them at this point, um, but I will be sending an email to the management and also leaving a review on the, the website um, because they had that card saying, we care, please don't, you know, uh, if you hang your towels on the rack, we won't change them. So I thought, great hung my trial, uh, towels on the rack, came back later on, they'd been changed. I thought, hmm, okay. So the next day, I was there four nights, the next day I put the, the card actually on top of my towel on the rack. So they would have had to have moved the card in order to, to change my towel. Um, and obviously they should know what that uh, card means. Came back, 
towels had still been changed. And the same with the bed linen, bed linen every single day, despite the fact I was leaving the card on top of it, so they'd have to move it. Um, so it's just not acceptable. This is greenwashing, plain and simple. Um, and I know it's not the first time I've had that experience at a hotel. So yeah. um, that's something as con you know, consumers, customers, we can call that out and just speak to the manager and say, hey, come on. I'm trying here to help you guys do what you say you want to do. So let, let's be And I honest. think as consumers, uh, you can do, you can communicate that beforehand too. Yeah. Uh, so whenever I book a hotel or a guest house, I always, there is always a place to add a mention, right? A mm. comment. And I usually say, I don't need any plastic water bottles in the room, please. Um, I don't need my linen changed and towels every day. Yeah. You know, if it's multiple nights, I, I usually follow a, a vegan diet, like just put it mm. out there. Mm. And then usually you get a response saying, oh, great. Well, we'll make sure there's something in the buffet, uh, which yeah. is vegan. Or uh, we'll, we'll take bottles out. Oh, we sometimes put that in for convenience. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can try to just, mm. you're planting seeds as well as, as yeah. asking for something for you. But you're also, it's like educating from the customer side, which sounds Very crazy. Much. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's something it's possible to do, right? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And I think um, uh, sort of coming from the, the corporate side as well, sort of as a company, like we, I was there last week with a client. They'd booked the hotel for us um, and we were using a room in the hotel for the workshop we were doing. Um, and again, you know, we had jugs of um, water, which was nice to see rather than, and, you know, cups we could reuse rather than um, bottles. But they were still trying to give us, plastic bottles with our, our um, lunch set. And I just sort of very politely just said, sorry, I don't use plastic bottles, thank you. And it was, oh, got it? You know, really surprised reaction. You just explain it's because of the environment, the tap water here is good. I'm perfectly happy with that, thank you. And you've just made them think, right? Um, so I think I, I like your idea of being proactive about that. My, I've been maybe too reactive so far, but uh, no, no. Yeah. And the, the communication think. side, you know, don't hmm. underestimate the fact that a lot of businesses I talk to say, oh, customers don't care about that. Right. Hmm. So being a customer who communicates clearly, I think, is yeah. something that's important part of the process. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we got great comments from Natasha. Thanks for joining on YouTube. Uh, Deb as well. Great to see you guys here. Just downloaded the My Mizu app. Fantastic. Brilliant. <laughs> and keep your trash in your own backyard. Absolutely, Natasha. You guys are 100% correct. Um, another issue I, I mentioned about uh, the trash issue, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that companies, uh, countries like Japan are shipping a lot of our mm -hmm. plastic waste. Uh, which is very irresponsible and other things uh, like taking your own chopsticks right yes taking taking your own fork or spoon or straw mm -hmm. you know like especially places which are so pristine and so sacred and so lovely to visit yeah uh, tourism recently over tourism has been a big issue mm -hmm. um mount fuji there's a, f a convenience store which is now blocking the view of mount fuji there's parts of kyoto which have been banned for tourists so it's not only the visitors themselves who mm -hmm. need to show how they want to be better. They're interested in culture. They're not one of the baddies, you know, because <laughs> there's always going to be a bad apple. Yeah. So how can you as a visitor stand out and be one of the welcomed ones and, and people appreciate you coming is also a, a key issue right now as yeah, uh, tourism yeah. is booming, right? Yes, yes, very much so. Now you had a way to reuse. Oh, one more thing about the water issue. Yep. So Japan Times, I'm always impressed. Japan Times, thank you so mm -hmm. much for often focusing on environmental issues, uh, sustainability in Japan issues. And this was an article they did on bottled water, which has more plastic particles than previously thought, which mm. is new research that came out. So even as someone drinking from a plastic water bottle, it's less healthy for you. So yeah. tap water is healthier. So that's something that I think uh, we didn't really know that clearly before. Yeah. And uh, if you have a chance to pick up a Japan Times in a big city in Japan, uh, they often have a sustainable Japan section. So a little shout yes. out to them. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant work. Keep it up, Japan Times. Yeah. Now let's talk about your shoe project. This is amazing, <laughs> Dova. 
<laughs> so this was yesterday. So a good friend of mine, Sarah Goretta, who um, is also a sustainability expert. Um, she is also very creative um, and has recently started a sort of leather painting to give old items a new lease of life. Um, and so yesterday, a group of us went over to her house and she's got everything there and, and knows how to do it. So I had a pair of shoes, which I really liked, super comfortable, um, but they were beginning to look quite shabby. They got marks that I couldn't get off and this kind of thing. So I painted them a different color and I should be wearing them later today when I go out um, and they look and feel like a brand new pair of shoes. Um, so really sort of, it, it was great to have an opportunity just to, to take something that's looking, um, you know, perhaps not nice enough to really use anymore um, and just think creatively and go, well, actually, what could I do with this? And she's done it with uh, with bags um, and sort of wallets and things um, and, and with shoes as well. And, and it's nice. It's something unique and interesting. And it just means that you can keep on using it um, for a whole lot longer. Um, which you know is obviously a lot more sustainable for your bank account as well as the environment. So uh, lots of good stuff. And textile waste, I heard, is 10% of global yes. waste issues. So it's, it's a big huge deal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there, there's loads of, I mean, in Japan, I know we're very lucky, and I'm sure it's the same elsewhere. You can go to somewhere like Tokyo Hands or Loft, and they've got fabric paints. They've got, um, I've just seen Natasha's comment there, vegan leather I could paint. Yes. I mean, they've got paints for every kind of surface you can think of. So, I mean, it's, it's worth just looking around and going, well, actually, could I just give this thing a new lease of life and then off we go. You can use it for another however many years. Um, so, yeah. And also wandering through some of the secondhand shops. Sometimes you find great things at Second Street, Book yep. Off. We have a lot of great secondhand shops here in Japan. Yeah. Um, I've even heard of some people doing like travel tours in cities where they go to all the great secondhand shops and Brilliant. it's really popular. Yeah. And quite often with visitors, we need, we're looking for larger sizes, which is sometimes mm -hmm. hard in <laughs> some of the main brands right yes. um but you can often find like mm. i guess more used or stretched yeah. out or you know just in, given by international people too yeah um so you got a variety of sizes as well yes very much so actually i took my son to one a couple of days ago because you know like all kids he's got this annoying habit of growing out of things and the weather's warming up and we didn't have enough shorts so quick trip to uh, second street up the road and uh, came home with i think three items grand total of 900 yen so oh yeah it's always a bargain now yeah. you can sell uh, some of your stuff as well um, but you don't get much. Just be yeah. warned, you're not going to get a lot of money if you try to sell usually a couple hundred yen if you're lucky. <laughs> but you're doing the right thing, you know, instead yeah. of going to the garbage, which most of it is incinerated, right? Mm. There are some companies abroad which are like making bricks or yes. uh, different materials out of used clothing. That would be great to see more of in Japan as well. Yeah, right? yeah, would love to see that happen. Now, something I just came back from. Uh, at the beginning of the well middle of this month uh was the minka summit now this was the third time they've done it and we were back in beautiful rural kyoto hanase village and we had some really interesting tours around thatch villages now these are thatch straw houses which are actually being lived in so when you visit this area in miyama that was lovely to see um how people are living in and enjoying using them and we went to a design studio of 2M26, a design couple um, from France, and they changed their roof, which had tiles and metal on it, into a straw thatch. <laughs> and it was lovely talking to them. And not only about the learning the process of doing thatch houses, which is wonderful to preserve that culture, but also they said, it absorbs all of the humidity. So they're really looking forward to what it'll be like in summer. <laughs> Um, but the sound of rain, like even aesthetically yeah. pleasing. Mm -hmm. And uh, this couple had also rescued some horses in Japan to before they became basashi, uh, horse sashimi, which is a thing in some parts. Uh, they also rescued dogs. Uh, they built a beautiful stable out of wood. They built beautiful chicken coop. So it was really cool to see their amazing atelier Wonderful. there. Uh, Asby Brown, who has written many books, on architecture and sustainable living in Japanese culture uh, was the keynote speaker. 
uh, the Minka Mall had this beautiful bento uh, lunch, which was locally sourced and served on a wooden cutting board. So it was zero waste. It was wow. awesome to see. As this was the Minka Mall, they had some workshops for making straw thatch roof, uh, also natural plaster. Um, I had the chance to interview uh, quite a few people and add it to my popular collection of uh, the whole playlist is on reusing old houses and rural life. Um, so this is a growing bit of enthusiasm uh, in Japan. And it's so nice to be around other people who really want to restore or reuse these old houses in some way and yeah. enjoy living in rural Japan, which is a big yeah. issue with declining population. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So many positives coming out of that. That's fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, uh, you had the chance to go to the Tokyo Rainbow Pride. You yes. Know? Yeah, it was incredible. We were lucky enough to have perfect weather the whole weekend. Um, and I think record numbers of people, I was hearing 270,000 people or something came over the weekend to Pride in uh, Yoyogi Park. Um, we had a little bit of rain on, on ours just in the afternoon when we were out marching. Um, but it was a really great atmosphere, I have to say. It just felt really positive. And as we were doing the march through Tokyo, there was a lot of um, sort of positive response from the, the crowds as we went past. That was um, really nice to see. And there were a lot of companies there. And, and for me, I mean, I work with big corporates. So I was really happy at first to see all the pretty much all our clients there, which was great, um, sort of getting involved and um, talking about what they're doing inside their organizations and so and so on. And then I was speaking to a couple of friends afterwards um, and one of them was saying, yeah, but is it getting too corporate? Is it, you know, who is Pride for actually? And, and is this kind of values washing when, you know, are they really doing what they say they're doing? Um, so that, that was sort of interesting, gave me food for thought, I think. I'd like to highlight one example, though, I saw that was really, I thought, very positive from a um, company perspective. So Rakuten, who um, one of our, our biggest clients, we've been working with them for many years, um, was talking to them. And they last year had a booth where um, they had a survey going on that anyone attending Pride could take part in. And um, they have a, a large travel business, Rakuten Travel, right? And they work with a lot of big and small um, sort of hoteliers and restaurants and stuff across Japan. Um, and so they gathered all this data on how inclusive is your experience as an LGBTQ plus um, member, you know, how have you've been received, any challenges you've had, what would make it more comfortable, more inclusive and so on. And then, so that was last year and they got about 900 responses or so. And then they used that data to create sort of guidelines um, and uh, sort of ways to improve on the, the experience for, that they shared then with their whole network of travel um, sort of community. Um, so they're actually looking at how can we build this into the business and yes you know it's good to be seen at pride and we show that we're actively doing something but they're also making sure that it has a real impact in the business and is improving things for the community so i thought that was a really nice example to see if they're not just sort of looking just inside their own company they're actually looking at how can we use our influence how can we use the knowledge we can get here and actually make things better um across uh, you know, our whole value chain. So it was really a, a very positive example of what can be done, I think. And so important right now, as the Japanese population is declining, and we are having more international long term residents yep. coming in, we need to talk about inclusion and diversity and yep. acceptance. And I think on the day to day, most people would say they don't have a problem. Mm -hmm. But you also need the rules and regulations and guidelines and company infrastructure to also be inclusive and uh, in including diversity in the yeah in their plans and infrastructure right yep yeah, yep yeah, very much and great comment from natasha there's in that you know it does seem like an ad parade sometimes you want to see in, in the community all year long and couldn't agree more so whatever we're talking about whether it's dei stuff or whether it's you know sustainability efforts it's not just just for earth day or just for pride i mean this needs to be ongoing absolutely part of the way things are done right 
Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a, a friend here locally who helps uh, legally when you have a same sex couple and one of them gets a job in Japan and you want to come over yeah. as a as a committed same sex couple. How do you get a visa for the partner? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of those issues, which, yep. you know, the government needs to also be thinking about how yes. to be more inclusive and, yeah. and include differences in uh in the international community that maybe are not standard yet in japan yeah. right and that's where companies can really help right using their their power their connections with you know kdan ren the the business community here or to to push for policy change because i know we've had friends that have had this issue you know a couple who were legally married in the netherlands uh one was transferred over here and obviously his visa was fine because it was the work visa, but then trying to get the visa for his husband was incredibly difficult. But that's where the companies can say, look, we want to bring this talent. Japan needs the talent to, to come and work here. But if you know the, the policies are just making it incredibly difficult to do that, then the companies can then use that you know, the, the reach and the leverage that they have to, to advocate for change. So it'd be good to see more of that happening as well. Absolutely. Um, the name of uh, her business, if anybody needs support, is Shacho Bell. And uh, she speaks English and a bit of Spanish as well as Japanese. So Fantastic. I'll put that in the link below. Yeah, great one. Yeah. Um, so we have a few minutes left. Uh, is there something we haven't touched on yet? I think the only thing for me was getting out and about in nature during Golden oh, yes. Week. We've got yes, a few yes. days off. <laughs> so it was, it was uh, Earth Day, and yes. a lot of people can get out and enjoy Earth Day every day, of course, including when you have holidays with your kids. Yes. So tell us about it. <laughs> so um, a couple of days ago, uh, it was really rubbish weather, actually. And so we were watching, I was watching with my kids uh, something on the National Geographic channel about um, sort of bugs and things. And they were looking at ant colonies and and how they sort of communicate with each other and interact and so on. And then we were in the park when the weather was beautiful um, two days ago. And the kids spent, I don't know, an hour or more just sitting watching this ant colony um, just sort of under a tree where we were sat eating our lunch. Um, and we put some little crumbs down from our food and we were just watching them then sort of obviously one scout ant found it and was then going back and communicating with the others. And we could see the things, them doing the things that we'd seen on the documentary the night before. And it just kept them absolutely absorbed and fascinated, as you can see there for ages, um, just watching these ants carrying off the bits of food. Um, and I thought it's just, it's wonderful to get out and about and see that, you know, what you see on the TV, it's happening all around us there. Um, we live in an amazing world. So it was really wonderful just to get out and, and enjoy and appreciate that. And hopefully if people can do more of that and get connections, um, you know, feel that emotional connection to the world that we're living in and not just sort of see it as something we're, we're um, viewing from the outside, then uh, it, it keeps keeps people engaged and hopefully sort of looking more to, to what they can do to protect it. So yeah, yeah it was a good day. Absolutely. And I think, you know, like I've started carrying around a, a plastic garbage bag, like reuse mm. some of the, the plastic bread bags that you get, yes. right? And then just have that in my pocket. And if I see things along the way, as I'm doing guiding, I'll pick it up. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I'll collect trash from guests because they're so frustrated with having no trash cans everywhere. And I, as a guide, I know where the trash cans are, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like that's an added service i'll take your garbage and i'll dispose of it for you you know maybe we need an app for that as well my mizu if you're listening <laughs> my garbage there are the trash cans yeah yeah. 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 Oh, yeah funny um but definitely we've got a big long holiday coming up right some people have already started because yesterday was a holiday uh, but three, four, five, I think, are officially the Golden Week holidays, right? Yep. And Monday is off as well because f uh, the fifth is normally um, a national holiday, right? A day off, but it That's falls right. on the weekend. Ah. So they've uh, made Monday a holiday too. So four day weekend coming up. So a good chance to get out there and, and see what's going on. Any, in the any events happening in your area? In Hiroshima, we always have a big flower festival. Uh, the whole Peace Boulevard is closed. We have food stalls and parades and it's lots lots yeah. of fun 
I'm sure there are. I can't, I can't say I actually know of any going on. I'm meeting up with friends for uh, Spartan training and, and barbecue. Um, so just to relax and do a bit of exercise and then undo it all by eating too much but afterwards, but never mind. Very nice. Sometimes <laughs> it's nice not to go too far because you don't have to deal with crowds on trains or, or traffic, right? So if you can find something locally that's fun, that's always nice. Yeah. And of course, better on your impact for the travel. So all good. Oh, nice. You got a shout out from Natasha. Uh, you're <laughs> such a cool mom. I'm a nanny and we look at bugs all the time. I think this is one of the nice things about Japan <laughs> is that kids are taught to appreciate bugs, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's great. The, the kids, I mean, my son a few weeks ago with school was sort of doing the machi tanken where they go out and they they look at how many different plant species or animal species they see. And then I think that's wonderful. So, um, yeah, we can build on that as well as parents or nannies. Um, so, yeah. And we had a question. What is Spartan training? <laughs> Koga is a super athlete. This is an endurance I'm race, not, right? it, it's, it's an endurance it's, race. It's obstacle course racing, and I do it with a team. We're a bit of a, a motley bunch. Um, we're not at all competitive, but we have a lot of fun, and it gives us just an incentive to keep a bit more active and fitter. Um, so, yeah, if you don't know Spartan. Course. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, I hope you enjoy it, but it's also a great way to keep in shape. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll end it there. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you again, Tova. Uh, lots of great ideas there, um, some challenges, but also some points of positivity and some strategies that you might be able to implement. So if you, anything stood out or you have any comments or questions, please make sure to add them below, and we'll get back to you. Brilliant. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. This is Seek Sustainable Japan, and our monthly short takes, 30 minutes talk with Joy and Tova. I'm JJ Walsh, or Joy, based in Hiroshima, Japan, and... Hi, I'm Tova Kinooka, and I'm in Yokohama, Japan. It's always great to talk to you. I can't believe it's been a month since we <laughs> talked last time. It seems like yesterday, right? Plus... Very much. <laughs> And you're busy and I'm I'm busy doing tourism things. You're doing a lot of like events and business consulting. Uh, so we're gonna dive right into that uh, a lot a bit later. But uh, one thing I've noticed, Tova, maybe you're seeing in your area too now, a lot of hydrangeas are just starting to come out. Another yes. round, beautiful yeah, yeah. flowers. Nature's bouquet, right? Absolutely, I've got some in the garden just starting to show flowers actually, so yeah. Oh nice! Beautiful time of year. And when you've got a lovely garden out there, I've got a little garden here and one thing I'm trying this year, which I never tried before, is I have a potted plant, uh, like a pot full of water and I've got some water plants and I bought some little medaka fish. Ah. And I saw that at Daishoin Temple in Hiroshima on Miyajima Island and they say it's a way to reduce your mosquitoes huh. because the mosquitoes will lay their eggs on the water and the fish will eat the eggs. And so I'm trying it, see if it works. That's a brilliant <laughs> idea. I think I might try that as well because mosquitoes are an absolute pain. Yeah, sometimes you can get great ideas as you're walking around Japan, right? Yeah. That's what we love about living here. <laughs> uh, Tova, do you want to start about one of the energy events conference that you went to? Right. So this was not just energy. So this was the Responsible Investor Japan conference. So I've just spent the last two days, two full days there. Um, very, very intense, um, but really interesting event, actually. Much, much more um, interesting and impactful than I'd anticipated. So there are about a thousand people there um, from not just in Japan, but from all over sort of Asia and beyond as well. Um, and obviously it's sort of responsible investor, it's focusing on investment, but there were lots of different areas covered. So one sort of big area was the energy transition, right? Away from fossil fuels to um, renewable energies. Um, and we've hear a lot in Japan, a lot of excuses maybe about, you know, the suitability of Japan for for different types of renewables and things and um, you know the, the government's uh, predictions on what you know the capabilities here have been actually very very um, conservative and sort of a lot of pushback and saying actually we need LNG and stuff which is not actually a renewable at all and produces huge amounts of methane um, 
So it was really interesting to hear experts from Japan um, absolutely blowing those things out of the water. And you can see here the simulation result for 2035 moving away from the, the fossil fuel mix. And the red part at the bottom on the left there is um, nuclear. And I was really really happy to see that in the uh, on the right hand side there's no nuclear um in a country with 20 percent of whatever it is of the world's earthquakes i think that's a good move um but huge capability or huge capacity for um solar for wind for geothermal you know there is a huge amount of potential here and yes you know that things still need to evolve and there was some talk about um the needs to be more work done on the impact of natural disasters and particularly sort of typhoons and things on the stability of renewable energy particularly wind um if you've got sort of floating wind um and so on but you know that's not an excuse that the the technology is there the capacity is there the the speaker from um takase -san from the uh, Renewable Energy Institute in Japan was very clear. She's like, the current policy is biased. We have huge capacity here for this. No excuses. We can do it. So that was really, and as you can see on this slide, I mean, it's a huge opportunity here. Um, you know, the nature related um, sort of solutions that are out there, renewable energies and so on. There, there's huge business opportunities, as well as this being obviously an imperative to, to keep the planet livable. Um, so, I, I yeah. read a great article in the Japan Times hmm. uh, last week talking about how Japan's government is now thinking of the importance of renewable energy and the transition to cleaner energy. Yeah. Because of this new agreement they're going into with the U.S. about increasing the digital uh, the level of digital literacy or the amount mm -hmm. that Japan is able to do in the digital business world. And that might be a way to rebound Japan's economy. Hmm. And it was really interesting that this was the incentive to do the change to renewable energy and the standards around the world being more clean energy. And it was a yep. great article by Japan Times. So I'll try to. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, great, to, great to see that. Yeah. Oh, no, fantastic. Really, whatever works to get us transitioning, right? Exactly. Yeah. But, I mean, one of the in, sort of very key points that uh, I'm sure we've mentioned before is that there needs to be a collaboration across sectors, right? So, yes, you've got the renewable energy companies. Um, you know, sort of as key players there. But the government also needs to be setting policy, you know, to begin with, perhaps subsidies for renewables to get them moving or more subsidies. There are already some going on. Um, but also there needs to be better infrastructure built out. A lot of Japan's um, infrastructure energy grid at the moment is very um, sort of fragmented. That needs to be um, more cohesive. But also changing consumers behavior and understanding right of, of what's possible and and what are the the pros and cons of different energy sources at the moment there's there's really not a lot of knowledge out there um and so i think you know people like you who've got your your solar and stuff going on i mean this we know it's possible i'm beginning to see more and more of it around but i think there still needs to be a lot more education um in the public sphere about um you know what the options are yeah for sure and it would be great to see more big companies like all the electric companies talking about uh adding solar to existing solar uh capacity that you have yep. um what the incentives are i think there's a lot of consumers that don't know mm. that there might be government subsidies it's it's very unclear yeah. um whenever i walk into an electric uh, you know, there's a lot around Japan. Mm. I always ask about solar and do you guys do installations and what are your prices? Because it used to be until about five years ago, it used to be one of the main posters and promotions yeah. that you would see when you walked mm. in. Even Costco was selling solar panels for a while. Wow. Yeah. So mm. you don't see that anymore. So mm. it's it's like we need the consumer to realize that actually you can decrease your energy bill. It's an investment. Investment. You can pay it off yeah. in about 10 years and then have cheaper energy. Like mm. even for the individual user, there's a lot of benefits in Japan yeah. for having solar. Yeah. And people say, well, there's no big uh, feed in tariff anymore. Well, that's true. But the price of solar, when we went in what, 15 years ago, we bought mm. it, it was 3 million yen. 
for a three kilowatt system. Now it's 1 million yen. That's so the price has yeah. significantly mm, come mm. down in Japan. So yeah. definitely worth uh, thinking about to save money, not only yeah. to reduce your carbon impact, also to have energy security, right? That's a really key one, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, whatever you don't use is hmm. sold to your neighbors. Maybe you don't get a lot of money back, but isn't it nice knowing your neighbors are also using your clean energy, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> I love that idea. Or it would improve na neighbor neighborly relations. So. Right? It's like thing. part of the yeah. big community, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And exactly. then with battery technology coming in, a lot of people are choosing to have home batteries. And then what you don't use, you can store and you can use it at night, right? Yeah. And home batteries also are coming down in price. Uh, Panasonic is really in the game right now. So, yeah. you know, just keep having an eye on it. Keep it in mind when you're thinking of the next thing to do in your house. Very and nice. uh, I think it's worth an investment. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, I mean, that that was one of the, the big topics there. And I was really encouraged to, to see, you know, real experts from Japan um, talking about the potential here and, 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 and also just calling out the current policy and saying this is completely biased. We're not listening to, you know, the right people. We're, we're, actually sort of not making good policy here we need to involve all the different stakeholders um in the conversation and making the energy strategy going forward um and build that together and there is huge potential so really encouraging um, another key topic at the um event was biodiversity and um of course we've had the last year the tnfd the ta uh, task force for nature related uh, financial disclosure disclosures very difficult to say um coming out sort of on, on the back of TCFD on carbon that people have been sort of perhaps more familiar with for a while. Now we've got the nature version of that. And there's been a lot of discussion of like, okay, well, this is all a bit hard. Carbon's easy to understand. You know, you can measure it. Um, you can very easily set targets and see how you can reduce carbon. But for things like sort of biodiversity, that's much harder. Um, there's still no globally aligned uh, definition of nature positive, which is something we see on a lot of um, companies' websites, you know, and their ambitions. We want to be uh, net zero, you know, carbon neutral and nature positive, we often see. And it's like, okay, well, what does that actually mean? Um, but then I, one of the panelists uh, was saying, well, that can't be an excuse. Yes, we need to, you know, keep working on that definition and that's in process now, but that's not an excuse for inaction. We can't sit around waiting for agreement. It's like, okay, we don't have perfect data yet. And with biodiversity, that might actually be very hard to get, although we've got some great sort of technology sorry, noisy truck going past, um, sort of coming in to help with that. But um, we need to get moving and get comfortable with using the what we do have in terms of data and saying, well, this is good enough for now. And no more excuses. Let's set a target. Let's set our milestones and get moving on this. And if we need to adjust it further down the line when, you know, sort of more accurate data comes to light, that's fine, but let's get moving on this. And it's so closely tied to um, the whole sort of climate change and, and um, energy uh, issue as well. You know, th these things are not not separate. They're very, that's very right. deeply interconnected. So. And that's, that's one of the frustrations, isn't it? Like for big climate conferences like COP, <laughs> even this year, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the things people are really focused on, really passionate about are things that are unproven future technologies. Mm -hmm. And you're yep. like, we have solutions right now. Let's go with what we have. So that's yep. wonderful to hear that that was kind of the thread underlying yeah. thread of this event yeah no it was really good so Fantastic. Um, lots of brilliant takeaways i could talk about it forever but i'm going to be doing a more comprehensive post on on linkedin um hopefully later today oh great I'll, I'll put the link below that's fantastic brilliant. thank you um now a lot of these topics are very confusing and i found a great podcast recently uh, which is based in the uk which i wanted to give a shout out to it's called uh, sustainability solved and they've been tackling like some of the myths um, that people talk about and really interesting kind of off the radar topics. Like their most recent one I was listening to is about the funeral industry and how sustainable is the way we is deal with the end of life, you right. know? And then one of the really interesting takeaways from that episode was 
if you can think of somewhere to lay your loved ones to rest where it's easy for you to go by public transportation to visit them, that's one of the biggest carbon emitters. Wow. is people driving far to go yeah. or flying to go and visit, right? Huh. So if you can find a way to honor their memory uh, without traveling, hmm. that was one of the biggest emitters. And that that's something I'd never thought about before. Never so, uh, she was saying, mm. uh, maybe do a recipe that your mom loved if she passes, you know, like the think of them without having to physically drive or go. And so, yeah, really interesting ideas uh, done by endless sustainability consultants in the UK. And uh, it's always great to listen what people are doing outside of Japan, because there's a lot of issues that we don't really hear about here, but we can definitely learn yeah from other areas too right absolutely absolutely we need need all of this um you know cross-border learning as well and i think there's a lot of great stuff happening in japan that that can um you know be taken over seas as well like your your idea you know the thing you're just doing with the uh, the fish and the reducing mosquitoes i mean that, that's wonderful people can do that yeah and it's it's good for me because i don't have to buy an aerosol with a mosquito repellent uh, you know, like we usually use the traditional Japanese coils yep. in the yes. garden, right? So that, that yeah. seems about, it doesn't really work that well. So anything no. that works and it's natural and, you know, the fish are drinking out of the water tank as well. So we'll see how far it goes. Uh, the cats <laughs> seem to like it. <laughs> Great idea. Well, the, the, they like the fish or the... <laughs> well, the cats are kind of interested. So we'll see how long it lasts. But um, it's worth trying these. Can you Absolutely. hear the frogs outside? The yes. frogs are really active this time of year. It's oh, crazy. Wonderful. <laughs> now, Toba, um, you wanted to mention also the REI event? Yep. So on the or oh, next month, the 20th of June is World Refugee Day. Um, and we've got uh, an experiential workshop and networking session. So myself and my colleague Mete Yatsi um, are co-facilitating that. It'll be bilingual English Japanese, um, hosted by ADECO um, at the Innovation Lab in Tokyo. Um, and we're going to be looking at the, the theme of empowerment and engagement. So how can leaders empower? their people to be more engaged, to be more um, proactive um, and uh, just more productive as well um, in the organization. So we're going to be using, um, well, we've got a an very experiential activity. I'm not going to say any more than that, but um, we'll also be looking at some REI case studies um, from the, the projects that they support of people that have really overcome incredible, you know, incredibly difficult situations. Um, but through being able to be empowered by um, the approach that REI takes, they've actually gone on to, to really contribute very much to, you know, rebuild their own lives, but also contribute to the communities around them and be sort of really productive members of that. And that's something that we can emulate in organizations. Um, there's a lot to learn from their story. So really looking forward to that. Fantastic. And the idea that we are all refugees and, it, you know, depending on what happens in our countries due to climate change or yeah. war, and we are all potentially refugees, right? Yeah. So these are things that could affect us all, right? Indeed. Yeah. yeah. Another event coming up is with our mutual friend, Alana Bonzi. Uh, tell us about this. So this is um, the World Oceans Day event um, from sea to summit, as you can see there. So she's got two, uh, Alana's got two incredible speakers lined up for this. So for the seaside, there's um, Ai Futaki, who, um, for those of you who don't know, is based in, uh, I think, Zushi or Kamakura um, and is a, a world class um, free diver absolutely amazing lady um and artist takes incredible um photographs of you know as she's diving and stuff of underwater um so she's one of the speakers and then um our friend carol fuchs um who is a climate activist climate scientist um and is sort of uh well she's climbed everest once already without oxygen um and is running a, a well, creating a documentary later this year. She's going to be running the sort of high trail in the Himalayas to document um, ice loss there and, you know, what the, the impact of that is on the local communities, but also on all of us, because 
those glaciers and the, the ice melt there, those feed the rivers that we all rely on then, um, that feed sort of uh, the places that are producing much of the world's rice, for example, and soy and things like this. So this affects us all. So it'd be a really interesting event and hosted by the Embassy of Canada, which is a lovely venue. Wonderful. Uh, also, you have a summer camp for kids coming up. Yes, so this is Atlantic Pacific, um, so UK-based MPO, but they work they in partnership with um, Kamaishi um, in Iwate Prefecture. So I think I've talked about them before, but they run these incredible camps uh, locally in, in Kamaishi every year where the kids will be learning about water safety, but also ocean conservation, um, disaster resilience. Kamaishi is one of the, the towns um, that was absolutely devastated by the 2011 uh, earthquake and tsunami, um, but have rebuilt um, an amazing stories. They're very, very inspiring. So um, the, the camp is a week. It's kids from local kids, but also from all over the world. My daughter did it last year and had an amazing time so would highly recommend if you've got uh, teenagers and um, you're looking for something useful for them to do during the holidays then that is a really really great experience that's wonderful to hear more like meaningful summer camps i know that my kids are looking for things which will look good on resumes for yeah. applying for university um, these kinds of things with more meaningful learning about the environment, learning, learning about the marine life as well, really yeah. can inform future yes. studies, but also help them in future like up applications. Too. Yeah, yeah, no, it, very much. Yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of sunscreen, because we're talking about spending more time outside, um, I'm mm. so happy to see that one of my favorite brands from Hawaii is now available in Japan. It's called Little Hands, Little Hands Hawaii Japan. So now they have their own website. Uh, if you go to the Little Hands uh, website, main one, you can get shipping from uh, Japan as well, as well as all over the world. Now, one of the things I love it about it is it's started by a working mother in Hawaii. It's all natural. It's in a reusable tin case, no plastic. Mm -hmm. And she has tinted as well as clear. So um, it's reef safe, uh, marine That's life safe, yeah. water resistant, and uh, you know, small local company. But now she's collaborating with this wonderful woman in Japan who loves the ocean, loves diving, loves Hawaii, and now bringing this also to mm -hmm. Japan cons consumers. So that's wonderful to see. Fantastic, yeah, because going into this season, we're definitely gonna be needing it. And uh, that's a great option to have. Now, one of the things connected to oceans, uh, which is always a contentious issue in Japan, is about whaling. Uh, it's been in the news recently about a lot of investment uh, going into whaling again in Japan. Uh, they started commercial whaling again uh, Japan stopped commercial whaling in 1988, um, but then has started again in 2019. And there's a lot of, uh, of course, many ethical issues, uh, many sustainability issues, um, but how does it affect the economy, right? So when I went to Ogasawara Islands, which is technically Tokyo, beautiful Ogasawara Islands in 1988, they were the first place when Japan stopped commercial whaling to change from whaling to whale watching. And it was beautiful to see how a lot of their tourism has been boosted mm. by now being a breeding ground for the humpback whales. Brilliant. Right? Yeah. And so it, yeah. is, it is possible to, to change that from the whaling industry where actually a lot of tax money is being invested in whaling, but there's very little demand for the actual product in Japan. Now there are three countries which are whaling right now, uh, Norway, Japan, and Iceland, commercial whaling. But Iceland has now announced that this year they're gonna stop whaling um, because there's no demand. And they said they only caught one whale in the last three years and there is so low demand and they have seen a boom in tourism for whale watching. 
So Iceland is now really all in for whale watching and conservation. So that's wonderful to see. And I think that's a great example for the path that Japan could also take and really yeah. make the most of whale watching in different parts of Japan uh, to yeah. boost the economy. That would be Go great away to see. From something that's not really wanted so much. Yeah. Uh, just just yeah. to show this from the University of Miami Shark Research and Conservation Program, um, they said in Norway, whale watching is estimated to be worth more than double the whaling industry. Uh, in Japan now, it's a little bit like almost even, but I think that we haven't really developed whale watching much as a tourism mm -hmm. asset. So I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, but yeah, we can get some good examples from abroad as well and inspiration from Iceland. It's nice to see. Yeah, fantastic. No, I would really love to see that shift. Yeah, great. Uh, oh, have we gone through it all in 23 minutes? So <laughs> I'm getting, I think there was one one more thing on my list, which was about um, relating to tourism, actually. Um, this uh, company in Japan startup called Tiny. Um, so they are uh, a small company that um, is looking at how can we uh, provide opportunities for people to, well, Japan has a, an accommodation shortage, as I'm sure you know. Um, you know, Japan wants to bring in lots more um, tourists to the com uh, country, but we're really actually quite short of accommodation. So their solution is these um, very quick to build kind of mobile, uh, but luxury um, accommodation units. So they are, they look pretty solid. I mean, looking at the photos there, but they're actually, they can be moved from place to place. And so their impact actually on the environment is very low. There's very little um, sort of disruption of the local um, sort of flora and fauna when they're building, because obviously they don't have to build a um, sort of a, a set building if you like um and then you know if it needs to be moved to another place um if uh, you know the the place the current site becomes unsuitable then you've got the option to do that um and so these look wonderful and they're talking about sort of obviously the mental health benefits getting people back into to nature and so on but also that this can um bring accommodation to places that maybe wouldn't ordinarily have it otherwise um so you're opening up new um areas and giving them the option to to bring tourists into there um and also it's you know much lower impact than building actual uh, sort of fixed buildings as well so lots of great um benefits to this um i think they've got a couple of them running at the moment and they're currently sort of raising funds to to expand and build more so it's uh, interesting i think i'm going to keep keep an eye on what's going on there that's fantastic i think in the, in the news there's been a lot of focus on over tourism mm. especially in japan we've had some big issues in tourism recently yeah. uh too many people crowding in to see the famous lawson convenience mm. store and and fuji view so now that's been blocked because they were disrupting traffic and leaving garbage too many mm. bad apples in the tourist i have to mention 99 percent of all of our international visitors are wonderful well-mannered <laughs> they really respect japan right but it's yep. with bad apple one percent who is really mm. getting in the news all the time yeah um, mm. i was traveling with a group by the streetcar in hiroshima to miyajima island the other day and there was a a group from the uk they were having a great time and one of the guys because it was bumpy he was holding yeah. on to the handles and then uh his wife said oh why don't you do a pull-up and i was like hey 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 wait a minute here yeah uh, maybe not maybe you guys might end up in the news like this is not really a thing and then all of them were like oh yeah 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 sorry 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 you know so even saying something you know you don't have to be like don't do that you can be like yeah maybe not you know <laughs> Like, we just need a reminder that even on vacation, you're in somebody else's place. Like, let's get a sense of where we are. And uh, we were in one of the most important Buddhist temples, Daishoin on Miyajima. And one of the young couples going up the, the stairs let out this horrible burp, <gasps> like really horrible belch, right when he reached the top. Oh. And then he's like, yeah. 
And one of my guests, I was like, oh my God. And mm. one of my guests actually said, do you mind? And then he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right? So I yeah. think a lot fellow travelers can do to help each other, yeah. but also have that understanding that actually it's such a few amount of people. I see thousands of visitors out every day and seriously, 99% are yeah. moving, like yeah. good mannered, well respect, you know? So it's, it's the 1% that really does stand out because a lot of people will talk amazing. about yeah. common decency in Japan and that's one yeah. of the things they love about it. And they, they appreciate people's kindness and, you know, we want to support that, you know, and, and most visitors respect that and want to support that as well. So yeah, yeah just a yeah. reminder, we're not all, all, not all the international travelers are bad, <laughs> but they will get in the news when they do something bad. Yeah. For the wrong reasons, <laughs> definitely for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Are you seeing more tourists around there? Around a lot, the actually. Um, and like you sort of mentioned earlier, the uh, the Ajisai, the hydrangea season is just starting, right? So that's always, particularly around Kamakura area, um, a lot of the temples there have absolutely amazing um, hydrangea, just apps, you know, just everywhere you go in different colors of them. And so it's a very popular time to visit. Um, so we're seeing a lot of people coming in which is really lovely um and i think you know through the the covid period obviously tourism in japan because it was closed for so long really really took a hit so um yes it's a little frustrating the trains are crowded or the roads are crowded or whatever but i'm also really pleased for you know the the local tourism industry to see that things are really booming yeah so but great. we you know as guides as uh tourists destination managers we can also offer places to refill our bottles yes. uh, get on the my mizu app uh, we can reduce waste i know a lot of guests will say there's no trash cans and mm. i explain why that it's an overflowing trash can is worse than no trash can and where they can properly yeah. dispose of things um, but also, you know, there's a bit of responsibility for the businesses here not to be selling single use. Absolutely. And if they are selling single use plastic, offer to take it back. Yeah. Have a trash can for the what they're selling, you know. Yeah. So I think there are some tweaks we definitely can be making mm -hmm. to make tourism a bit more sustainable. Yeah. But Japan was listed in the top three. Uh, top, Yeah, it was number three and five of the top sustainable travel destinations in the world. Great. So, you know, people yeah. do respect the preservation of culture mm. and good public transportation. So there are a lot of things we are doing right in yep. Japan. But of course, room for improvement. <laughs> <laughs> always, always. Okay. Uh, well, we'll stop there. Just we got just over 30 minutes. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you again, Tova. Always great talking to you. Likewise. Thank you. Still green.